All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start our uh, session here on Galatians chapter 2. It's the third session, but it's Galatians chapter 2 once you factor in the introduction here. And so go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2, and we'll start looking through Galatians. And I'll just tell you what, I, I've been so blessed getting into Galatians and just studying Galatians and just just really absorbing it and finding out all that Paul is teaching by the Spirit of God. And it, it's been such a blessing. I really hope it blesses you the way it has blessed me. But we'll go ahead and, as we've been doing throughout the, the commentary, is I'm going to read the Scripture and then make commentaries on, uh, on various verses and things like that. So we'll get started here. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 is we're going to look at the meeting that, that took place in Jerusalem. In verse 1, Paul says, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Now, when Paul says uh, 14 years, what he means here is it was, it was the interval from the time he was converted on the road to Damascus until he went to Jerusalem. It's that 14 years since he was converted... And Paul goes, Paul goes to Jerusalem, and he takes Barnabas and Titus with him. And now in, in verse 2, Paul says, It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation. He's talking about the twelve apostles. For fear that I might be running or had run in vain. And so Paul goes up, to Jerusalem, not because the 12 apostles called him there, and I think he wants people to know, the Galatians to know that, he goes up because of a revelation. Now, we don't know for sure exactly what that revelation was, but I believe it's the, uh, it's the prophecy in Acts chapter 11 when Agabus says, a prophet stands up and he says, a famine is coming over the entire world. And immediately the church in Antioch takes up an offering and they take up that offering and they give it to Paul, and they give it to Barnabas, and they send them to the Jerusalem church. That's what I think that revelation is. And so as Paul and Barnabas are going from Antioch to Jerusalem, Paul at that time, 14 years after he's been converted, Paul at that time wants to present the gospel he's been preaching to the Gentiles, to the twelve. And he even says here, I want, to, I, you know, I want to do it in private because I'm not sure, you know, I mean, well, Paul was about 99% confident that what he had been preaching was absolutely correct, but he wants to just be doubly correct that, that he has not been preaching in vain and that what he's been sharing is accurate. And so he, he says, I, I, I went up there and I wanted to share it with them in private because of a fear that I might be running or had run in vain. And so he goes and he presents to them that that gospel verse 3 but not even Titus who was with me though he was a Greek was compelled to be circumcised and so Paul here is basically saying the 12 not only accept my gospel the 12 not only ex accept my ministry to the Gentiles but the 12 did not even make Titus who's a Gentile an uncircumcised Gentile they did not require him to be circumcised. They basically accepted Paul's gospel and they accepted Titus exactly as he was. Verse 4, 4 through 5, But it was because of the, of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. Verse 5, But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. And so we've looked at what the Judaizers claim. They said, you can have faith in Jesus Christ, but unless you want to be saved, you've also got to obey the law of Moses. And you've got to be circumcised to be saved. And so they preach Jesus Christ plus works. Jesus Christ plus legalism. Jesus Christ plus obedience to the law for salvation. And so in this private meeting they have with the 12, some, uh, some secret brethren sneaked in and they were spying out the liberty that Paul and Barnabas and Titus had. And they were trying to bring them back under bondage. But Paul was like, you are not going to bring me under the law. 
I am not going back under the law. The, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ sets me free from legalism, sets me free from the law. I am no longer under the law. I am under grace. I'm not coming under that. And, and Paul's telling the Galatians here, he said, I did, not come, I did not succumb to that even for an hour because if I did, the gospel that I'm preaching to you would not be able to come to you. It says, I am not coming back under the law. Even though the Judaizers in Jerusalem sneaked into that private meeting, Paul says, we did not yield to them even for an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. Now, going on, going on to, uh, to uh, verse 6. But from those who are of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who are of reputation, they contributed nothing to me. When you first hear this, it almost sounds like Paul is arrogant or prideful. When I, I remember when I first used to read this, I'd be like, man, he kind of seems prideful. He seems a little uh, touchy or sensitive. It's like, you know, they contributed nothing to me. I am this apostle sent from God, and I've got this revelation. But that's really not at all what Paul was doing. Paul was defending his message. He was defending his ministry. Because remember, the Judaizers came in and they said, we are going to discredit the messenger because we don't like your message. And Paul is now saying, okay, listen, listen, Galatians, the, the 12, the ones of high reputation, they did not give me the gospel that I preached to you. The gospel I preached to you came directly from Jesus Christ. In fact, I've been preaching it for 14 years before I even took it to them and said, is this really the, the, do you agree with what I'm preaching? Do you agree with my gospel? And he's doing this not because of pride. He's doing it for the sake of the gospel. He's doing it for the Galatians so the Galatians would know Paul as the messenger of God has come with a direct revelation from Jesus Christ. The gospel that Paul preaches, which d deals a death blow to legalism, Paul is saying, I did not receive this from the 12. I did not re I received this directly from the Lord himself. Verse 7. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, verse 8, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And, and so Paul is basically just saying, you know, when I got together with the 12, they realized the hand of God is on me to go to the uncircumcised Gentiles, and the hand of Peter, or the hand of God is on Peter to go to the circumcised Jews. And so they, 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 uh, that's, what, that's all he's saying there. Verse 9, And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas, who's Peter, and John, who were, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Verse 10, they only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And so the main thing from there is that the, the three pillars of the church, John, Peter, and Paul, John, or John, Peter, and James welcomed in Barnabas and Paul and said, we give you the right hand of fellowship. You are, we are with you. We are brethren. We are part of the church. And that's what, uh, that's what, that, that verse is talking about. All right, now, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, is we're now going to look at when Paul opposed Peter. So what happens is, now, uh, 14 years after Paul was saved, he goes from Damascus to Jerusalem. Then he goes back from Jerusalem to Antioch, the Antioch area. And so a little bit later, we don't know exactly the time, Peter goes and he visits the church in Antioch. And when Peter goes and visits the church in Antioch, we're going to find out what happened in this particular incident because Paul describes it here in detail. And, uh, and starting in verse 11, when Cephas or Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For pri Verse 12, prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. Verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. And so what Paul's doing here is he's basically saying, Peter, that famous water walker, 
fem- uh, Peter, the one who did miracles. Peter, the one who was, I mean, Peter was the most famous guy in the church. And Paul's telling them, listen, Galatians, I'm not afraid to rebuke the most famous guy. I'm not afraid to do that because Peter was being a hypocrite. See, Peter was the one who came in Acts chapter 10. He had a vision of God welcoming in the uh, Gentiles. And he saw that, you know, remember that famous vision where the sheet comes down and three times God says, don't call what is unclean, clean, or don't call what is clean, unclean. That's the way he said it. And so Paul is, and then Peter, you know, had a heart for the Gentiles. And Peter goes, he's eating with the Gentiles because before Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles, they never shared table fellowship together because they thought that the Gentiles would defile them. And God had set it up that way for a season, for a few hundred years, because he wanted to preserve a remnant that would bring forth the Messiah. But now that the Messiah had come, now that time was over. And so basically, Peter is now eating with the, with the Gentiles, but all of a sudden, some Judaizers come from James. Now, I don't, if you read some other scriptures, it, it's evident that James never sent them, but they went, and they supposedly had his authority, and they began to convince Peter, hey, you shouldn't be eating with these unclean dogs. You should not be eating with these unclean Gentiles. They are going to defile you. They are going to make you lawless. They are going to make you unholy. You, you can't do that, Peter. And Peter, uh, fearing, Paul actually says, he feared the party of the circumcision. He feared them. He feared the party of the circumcision. And therefore, bait through the fear of man, he began to compromise and said, I cannot eat with you Gentiles anymore. And it got to the point where even Barnabas was carried away in Peter's hypocrisy. And the entire Jewish sect of that Antioch church said, we cannot eat with the Gentiles anymore. And you can imagine when Paul hears about this, he's furious. He's irate. I mean, here he, you know, Paul probably had the greatest revelation of what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. And you know, he talks about even uh, the, uh, a lot of historians or some historians call the, the church the third race because there was Jew, there was Gentile, and there was a church of God. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so this third race, does Paul have the revelation that there is no Jew or Gentile in Jesus Christ? We are all one in him. And so Paul had this revelation. And so anyway, he, he stands up and he's furious. He's, he's irate at Peter. He's like, you are being a hypocrite. You're the leader of the church, Peter. You're the water walker. You're the miracle worker. You're the one that's that walked with the Lord for three and a half years. And Paul's like, you cannot, in Jesus Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. You're making distinctions that the Lord does not make. Verse 14, Paul says, When I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. And so Paul is basically saying here, Peter, you cannot do this. You cannot do this. And it's interesting now, and uh, starting in verse 16, we get into the heart of Galatians. And it's interesting also that the first time Paul mentions justification by faith, it is when he stood up to rebuke Peter. Interesting. Here now in uh, verses 16 through 18, we talk up, we look at justification by faith. Verse 16, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. There is a tremendous amount of revelation in that one verse. I mean, just just packed, loaded with revelation. We're going to unpack some of that here right now. But here's the first time in the entire history of the world we are introduced to Paul's gospel of justification by faith apart from the works of the law. Because remember, Galatians is most likely the first New Testament epistle written, the first New Testament book written. And this is the first time Paul introduces us to justification by faith. And so, you know, if you, if you don't really know, okay, what does the word justification mean? Or what does it mean to be justified? And, and I just want to say, 
if you struggle with condemnation, if you struggle with the fact that you, you, know, you can never do enough to make God like you, or you always feel like you got to do more for God, you got to pray more, you got to read the Bible more, you got to fast more, you got to witness more, you need to do more and more for God to make Him accept you and like you and love you, then this book, is this justification is going to deliver you and set you free. And we're going to get into that. It's powerful. But justification means just as if you had never sinned. God makes you just as if you had never sinned in His eyes. It's far more, justification is far more than forgiveness. Justification is giving, gives you a status and a declaration of righteousness as if you had never even sinned. That's powerful. See, justification is more than pardon. Justification is a declaration from God himself that you are righteous in the very matter in which you are condemned. That just liberates us, doesn't it? That just sets us free, doesn't it? That God looks at us and he declares us righteous because we are in Jesus Christ. That's a powerful, powerful revelation. What this means is that even though we have transgressed God's law, 613 commandments given to Moses, we have transgressed God's law. We have, but when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, apart from any works of the law, before any acts of obedience, God then puts us in his son, Jesus Christ, and he imputes to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ to our account. He reckons us righteous, and he says, you are now not only forgiven, but I declare you righteous in my sight. That is powerful, powerful, powerful revelation. We're going we're gonna to just stay on this theme of justification here for a minute because I really want to just drill into some things here. The works of the law, Paul mentions the works of the law, and we may not really understand what, okay, what exactly does that mean? What does that mean, the works of the law? Well, Paul's going to drill into this. The works of the law is everything that is required to obey the 613 commandments of the moral, civil, ceremonial, and dietary laws of Moses. Everything, all that's required is the works of the law. The works of the law, all that is required for me to keep meticulously the law of Moses without fail, be blameless, all that's required is the works of the law. It would require everything in you, all the willpower, all the self-will, all the determination, everything you could muster to try to keep this, and, and Paul's saying those are the works of the law. You can never be right with God by the works of the law. You can never be justified because even if you obeyed every external commandment blamelessly, internally you have a sin nature, and so you might keep the commandment, don't murder, but inwardly you have anger towards your brother. See, and, that, and the Bible says that's actually murder. And so you might be able to refrain from adultery, but inwardly you are lusting after a woman. Or you inwardly you are coveting. And so God looks at that and says, you not only have to obey these 613 external commandments, you have to obey them not only externally, but also internally. And no man can do that because you don't have the nature to do that. You have the nature of Adam inside of you. So let's talk about here... Um, just a brief summary of six characteristics of justification. Uh, the first one is justification is not based upon obedience to God's commands. Praise God. We are not justified in God's sight because we obey Him. Law keeping, commandment keeping, no matter how well we do it, will never make us acceptable to, to God. The second thing about justification is justification ends boasting. See, see, when we try in our own power, gritting our teeth, clenching our fist, everything with self-effort and determination and willpower to try to obey God's commandments, it, see, if we're successful doing that, what happens? Immediately, we begin to be puffed up with self-righteousness and pride. Immediately, we begin to boast in our own ability and our own holiness and our own self-righteousness, and that right then and there disqualifies us. 
And so justification ends boasting. That means that, you know, whereas justification or whereas we, when we try to keep the law, we boast because of what we have done. When we say we cannot be right with God apart from Jesus Christ and we surrender and say no obedience will make me right with him, it ends boasting, but it begins worship. See, it ends boasting in what we can do in our flesh and we begin to proclaim what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It ends the self-proclaimed worship that I am some holy person and it begins the true worship of God in spirit and in truth. Number three, justification is by grace alone through faith alone. We do not achieve justification by what we do. We receive justification by what, by what Christ did on the cross. I'm going to say that one more time because that's powerful. We do not achieve justification by what we do. We receive justification by what Christ did. The law condemns the worst of us, or the best of us. The law condemns the best of us. Grace saves the worst of us. See, there's nothing we can do but receive. Justification is by grace alone through faith alone. Grace is the free and undeserved gift of God that justifies us. And grace is the unmerited and unearned power of God that sanctifies us. And God's grace always works through faith. See, that is, a, that is a liberating thought for us. How incredibly liberating is this, that, that we do not achieve justification, we receive it. We do not work for it, we just open our hearts and by faith say we receive it. Number four, justification breaks the power of sin. Oh, this is so important. I believe the deepest root of slavery to sin is the feeling that we can never be forgiven or made righteous. See, when you begin, see, if, especially, and all of us come from, from backgrounds, some, some worse backgrounds than others, but all of us are sinners. All of us have fallen from Christ. You know, some, some were born again when they were young, and they don't have much of a past like some of us do. But a lot of us have a real past and, you know, we look at our past and we look at the defilement and we look at all the terrible things we did and we, we believe the lie that says, I will never be right with God. I will never be pleasing to God because I did this, 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 and that. And so we believe that and that belief system brings us under condemnation, brings us under guilt, brings us under shame so that what then happens is sin is empowered because we don't feel accepted by God. Justification breaks the power of canceled sin. And let me explain what I mean by that. Stronger than the allurement of future sin is bondage from past sins. And so for God to bring us into a place of righteousness where guilt, shame, and condemnation is broken off our life God must cancel the sin by justifying the ungodly, by justifying those who are unrighteous in and of themselves. When that happens, the power of sin is broken. Guilt, shame, and condemnation lose their grip. God breaks the power of this canceled sin. See, once guilt is removed, the lure of future sin begins to break. Let me just make this a little bit more simple, is when I am in bondage to my past and what I have done, and, you know, I, I just, take what, just take lust, you know, as I am, I am filled with lust, I have an adulterous past, I've done all these terrible things, and I'm addicted to whatever, whatever, pornography or whatever it is it would be, I'm addicted to this sin or that sin, God will never like me. Well, see, what Paul says, no, and I'm not saying you are to continue in sin by any means. What I'm saying is this, is that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work on the cross and we say that even though I am unrighteous, even though I'm in bondage to sin, I put my faith not in what I do but in what, in what he did, God looks down at us and he says, I declare you righteous. I declare you forgiven. And when you feel that forgiveness, 
and you feel that declaration of righteousness come down on you, that then gives you the, the power to walk in greater purity and holiness because he cancels out the sin against you, breaking guilt, shame, and condemnation. Now then the allurement of sin is not quite what it used to be, giving you the power to walk in greater holiness. Justification breaks the power of sin. Justification precedes sanctification. Because justification breaks the power of sin, justification also precedes sanctification. See, before we, and I see this all the time. I see this, in, you know, once you understand justification, you can just see it in people as they struggle with sin. They struggle with some kind of a bondage. Usually what, if you, if you really get down deep, Usually what's going on inwardly is they struggle with guilt, shame, and condemnation because of their past sins. And once justification says you are no longer unrighteous, I declare you righteous in the matter for which you were accused, that breaks the power of canceled sin. And so then the sanctification process can begin where God can then begin that lifelong work of conforming you into the image and the nature of Jesus. Number six is justification precedes obedience. And let me make this pretty, pretty clear here. Obedience before faith, obedience before faith is what Paul called the works of the law. See, when you try to obey the external commandments before faith, that is the works of the law. And Christians can get into that mode even if it's not the Old Testament. We can do that with the New Testament commandments. We can do that with, I mean, a lot of the Old Testament commandments are carried into the New Testament. We can get into the same mentality that obedience before faith brings us into legalism. Obedience before faith can bring us into bondage. Justification then, where God says you are righteous and you are accepted before me, before you do any act of obedience, before you do any work for, for me, when that comes, then we then get into what Paul called the obedience of faith, where obedience comes out of our faith. Obedience proceeds from our faith. And so, it's vitally important that our obedience proceed faith. But oh, let, me, let me just say it like this. This is a little tongue twister. For this reason, it is vitally important that our obedience proceeds or proceeds from our faith rather than precedes our faith. Meaning that before we begin to obey, we need to be declared righteous. Now, let me just, in my notes here, I've got it, and you can check it out in the notes, but I, I just want to encourage you to go look at those. See, when we try to get justified, when we try to get justified by what we do, here, here's the difference between obedience before faith and obedience that comes from faith. Obedience before faith is obedience to gain God's approval. Obedience that comes out of faith is obedience, is, is obedience that comes because I have God's approval. Huge difference. I'll tell you what, that is a huge difference. When we try to obey God to gain his approval rather than obeying him because we have his approval, that is a, I mean, that might sound just like a few simple words. That is a major shift for most of us. See, when we try to obey to be accepted, we, we try to obey to become righteous rather than obeying because we are declared righteous. See, we obey, legalism obeys for acceptance. But when we are set free from legalism, we obey from acceptance. Legalism obeys God for favor. Living in the freedom from legalism, we obey from favor. Legalists obey God to avoid condemnation. Those who are declared righteous and justified obey because there is now no condemnation. See, the legalist obeys so that God will love us. 
The one who has been delivered from legalism obeys because, we, because God does love us. We know God loves us, and because God loves us, we then obey. The legalist obeys to prove their love for God. Those who are justified, those who are declared righteous, and they know it, they obey because we love God. Huge difference. Legalism nullifies God's grace. Those who are justified and declared righteous obey because they are empowered by His grace. Legalism leads to self-glorification and boasting, whereas when we are declared righteous and justified, it leads to God-glorification and worship. Legalism places us under a curse because Paul said, and we'll look at that in the next session, if you try to be justified by the law, you've got to keep every 16, all, 16, all 613 commandments. And if you don't, if you miss one, you're under a curse. But when we realize that we are declared righteous apart from the law by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we position ourselves for a blessing. See, legalism severs us from Christ. Being declared righteous and blameless and justified connects us to Christ. So I just encourage you, go read that in the notes. Just meditate on the, you know, just... Just a few little phrases, but think about it, meditate it, just see, okay, how often am I obeying God to try to gain his approval, gain his favor, gain his love, gain his righteousness, when you already have it, see, it's a, it's a completely different paradigm of living, is we are declared righteous, we are declared accepted, we are declared approved, we are declared loved by God, and all that we do springs forth from that legal position. That was not a COVID-19 cough. I have uh, allergies right now I'm struggling with. But anyway, verse 17. But if while we're seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Basically, Paul's telling Peter, he's like, you've come down and said, we don't need the law anymore. We don't need the law anymore. I mean, in terms of to be justified. And now if we're going to now have, we're going to separate from Gentiles because we think we're going to be defiled. You've, you've torn it down by the cross of Christ and you're trying to rebuild it. You're basically a transgressor. So now we get into crucified with Christ, Galatians 2, 19 through 21. And as we get into here, we're going to find out this is, the heart of Paul's gospel. I mean, just not only are we justified and declared righteous, but he's going to unpack for us things he will develop in much greater detail in the book of Romans, but he introduces us here to some powerful realities. Verse 19, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. And if, if you read Romans chapter 7, which goes right along with this verse of Scripture, Paul unpacks this in great detail. Paul unveils this in incredible detail. And he says, when, you, when Jesus Christ died and you are in him, you died with him. When Jesus Christ was crucified and buried and, and he died and was resurrected, you were crucified, buried, died, and were resurrected in him. You have the, the, your identity is in him, is in Jesus Christ. Therefore, when you, when he died, you died. And if you died, you died to the law. Praise God. We are not under the system of the law anymore. We are not under that, that legalistic system anymore. God has delivered the death blow. The hammer has come down to legalism, to justification by obedience to the works of the law. All of that, you have died to that in the body of Jesus Christ so that you might live for God, so that you might have the Spirit of God coming inside of you, so the Spirit of the Lord might come, fill you, anoint you, enable you to bear fruit for God. Beautiful, beautiful. Verse 20. Here we get into Paul, the, the heartbeat of Paul in his message, and I, this is, might be one of my favorite verses in Scripture, is Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. 
may not be a better description summarized of the Christian faith in that verse of Scripture right there. I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. Now, the question we would ask, okay, Paul, are you talking about a legal experience that happened like Romans 6 and 7 are talking about? Or are you talking about an experiential reality? And I think Paul would say both. I think Paul was saying legally, when Christ died, I died with him. Because Jesus Christ is the new covenant representative, and all that's true of him is imputed to all that are in him, meaning that now I am considered to be in my covenant partner, and what's true of him is true of me. He died, I died. He was resurrected, I was resurrected in God's eyes. That's true. That's our legal position. We have been crucified with Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit wants to take our legal position, or let me say it like this, the Holy Spirit wants to take our living condition, our experiential reality, and align it inwardly to our legal position. I have been crucified with Christ, but God wants to do a death in your soul to bring the work of the cross into our soul so that we are then experientially crucified with Jesus Christ and our self-life, our suke life, which is the word in the Greek, our suke life, our self-life is no longer the one living and driving us. That part of us is dying and is bringing brought to the cross. So the life, the zoe life of Jesus Christ inwardly in us by the Holy Spirit, he's now living rather than us. That's what Paul's getting at here. In Philippians 3.10, we, Paul, towards the end of his life, said, I want to be conformed to his death. So we realize in Galatians, which was many years before, Galatians, Paul had, uh, a, he had a very large degree of the death of Christ working in him experientially, but it wasn't fully consummated. It, it is consummated by the end of his life in Philippians. I want the, the death of Jesus Christ, I want to be conformed fully, inwardly to his death so that I might experience his resurrection. So Paul is talking about both the position of being crucified with Christ and the experience of being crucified with Christ because it is through the, the co-crucifixion of Jesus Christ and us entering into that experientially that the life of God in your spirit is released. And it's now no longer I who is living. See, Paul's getting on self-life right there. It's no longer self-life in my soul is no longer the fuel for my life. That suke life that all of us live by, that's no longer the, the source of my life. The source of my life is Christ in me. He's the one living. His life is the one living. His Zoe life is the one flowing in me and flowing through me. It's his life, the life of Christ, the indwelling life of Christ that's flowing through me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know, you can actually translate this. I think it's better translated as the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God. It's, in other words, Paul was saying is that when Christ came to dwell inside of me, he not only departed, imparted to me his life and his righteousness, he also imparted to me his faith. So that the faith of Jesus Christ in me is now become my faith in him. <laughs> That's powerful. That's powerful. Is that the, you know, so many Christians struggle, okay, I just don't have enough faith. I don't have enough faith. I don't have enough faith. Well, you're trying to have your own faith. Paul lived by the faith of the Son of God. Paul lived by another's faith, Jesus Christ in him. And so we want to get into that mode. We want to get into that living where we're no longer living by our own faith. And you know, a, lot of the, a lot of our own faith is mainly just soulish emotionalism, isn't it? 
You know, and you can find out how soulless your faith is when you're tested. And when you're tested and you're shaken, you realize, okay, I was living by a lot of emotion and hype, not by the faith of the Son of God. And so Paul lived his life inwardly by the faith of the Son of God. Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God. In other words, I do not cancel out the grace of God. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Paul's basically saying this, and he's going to develop this in, in throughout Galatians. External commandments, no matter how holy they are, external commandments, no matter that they came directly from God himself, they cannot have the ability to impart righteousness, and they do not have the ability to impart life. All external commandments can do is tell us, you must, and you shall, and you shall not, and you shall not do this. Those are the external commandments, but they cannot produce an inward righteousness ever. Only the Spirit of God can do that. Only the indwelling Spirit of God can do that. Only the indwelling Spirit of God can make you righteous internally. Only the indwelling Spirit of God can make you holy internally. And that's where Paul's leading us towards. And so we're going to go ahead and we'll bring Galatians chapter 2 to a close and then uh, get ready for Galatians chapter 3.